I'm Kevin Quinn. I'm at uh, the University at Albany State University of New York, and I'm a consultant to the New York State Technical Assistance Center for PBIS. Uh, it's nice to um, share time with this uh, time with you this morning, if only electronically. It's the second in a series of I think we're doing five webinars um, coming up to, in total, yep. um, and. Uh, this one is focused on integrating uh, applied behavior analytic approaches to behavior management with um, a growing literature on the importance of teacher-student relationships that are characterized by positiveness or positive uh, teacher-student relationships. So let's go ahead. The goals for today then are to review the evidence-based classroom management practices. These are essentially from an applied behavior analytic perspective. For many of you, they will look familiar. Um, and then we'll also review research findings on the connection between teacher-student relationships and student outcomes. And for me, what I've been in my own evolution is thinking about these issues. Um, I've been aware of both of these um, lines of research and scholarship and the evidence base growing in both areas, but they seem to be talked about separately and rarely integrated. We've got these technologies that um, or strategies or interventions or supports that are based on the applied behavior analytic model. We can uh, describe why they're effective um, by referencing the behavior pathway. Um, some of the interventions we talk about are antecedent interventions. Some of the interventions we talk about are teaching replacement behavior interventions. Some of the interventions we talk about are uh, clever manipulations of consequences so that desired behavior gets richly reinforced and undesirable behavior does not. And there's a number of ways to do those things. So that's the one literature base out there. Um, and it's may well be the one you're most familiar with, given PBIS is, in fact, a school-wide application of applied behavior analysis. The second literature that intrigues me, um, it's a bias I have, um, is uh, the growing empirical connection between, um, or empirical literature on the importance of um, the relationship between the student and the teacher. And so the goal today is to think, can we create mental models for ourselves, a cohesive nar narrative in our head where we seamlessly integrate this evidence-based literature on applied behavior analysis with the important literature on developing and sustaining um, positive teacher-student relationships. So, you know, over the next little while, you'll see um, I will confess to the fact that uh, this is actually new learning for me to integrate these two literatures. So I'll be interested in your feedback and questions and helping me refine my thinking in this area as well. Um, so let's get started. So here's your basic typical ABA model. Um, uh, if you listen to any, you know, as presenters of PBIS material, when we're, uh, it's all, PBIS is of course a means to an end. It's a framework for, uh, in the end, promoting, promoting enhanced student achievement, the uh, effective behavior management that leads to improved student social behavior is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And the effective, uh, and more recently, um, there's been an explicit acknowledgement that um, we don't get those achievement outcomes alone. Uh, if, if we do effective management alone, effective management needs to be paired systematically with um, the effective teaching literature. Um, and so the logic seems to be behavior problems reduce um, student academic, academic engage time and disrupt learning, whereas being academically engaged uh, uh, prevents behavior problems. And I would uh, make the case that there's a substantial amount of literature that indicates one of the primary antecedent triggers for troubling behavior in school is um, poor instruction and the way in which instruction um, is uh, most likely to trigger inappropriate behaviors that we frankly ask kids to do work that's too hard for them because they haven't mastered the necessary prerequisites. And we don't, um, we don't have a tight fit between our assessments of students' current level of academic functioning and then what we ask them to do uh, instructionally 
um, based on those uh, careful assessments of their current level of functioning. And so we teach outside of what good old Lev Vygotsky might have called the zone of proximal development. We work with students in their frustration zone. And um, as a result, many students troubling behavior have troubling behavior that is escape motivated under those conditions. So we need to get those two things working in sapatico. So the logic model is to uh, decrease disruptive problem behaviors lead to the, a decrease in the amount of time the teacher has to engage in redirection and behavioral support, which thereby increases instructional time. Uh, for the teacher and academic learning time for the student, and voila, we have these wonderful increased academic outcomes. That's the logic model, and indeed there is substantial uh, research to support that. On the other hand, we also have this logic model. This comes out of um, the work from Pianta and his colleagues at the University of Virginia on child-teacher relationships. This is their theoretical model. It's pretty straightforward. You can see the child and the teacher in the two circles. Um, and uh, you can see um, the lines between them with the half arrow pointing at one another is indicative of the, what uh, Piano calls the information exchange process, the interpersonal interactions between the two individuals. Um, the, the lines to the left and right of the circles, respectively, with arrows on either end, are the representational model. We have the, um, the broader external environmental influences as the large circle. Um, and so I think the point that I want to make is that this information exchange process, even though we're talking about the relationship, is this is the um, context in which the ABA interventions that we deliver are, um, are uh, occur. And um, this representational model is each person's mental representation of the other, the biases, the beliefs, the attributions. Uh, the internal reality, the, the mentalisms, the, uh, the narrative we create in our mind about who the other person is and our expectation bias for um, uh, how we expect them to, to approach us and, and treat us. Um, and so, uh, in essence, this is the relationship. So you can see here that even in this model, by looking at the information exchange process, um, we see that in this process, we want in that exchange between the, the teacher and the child, we want teachers to be implementing evidence-based uh, uh, behavioral supports that are typically based on the applied behavioral analytic model. Um, but in uh, uh, you can see that that's also integrated in that it is through those interactions that the relationship is developed and um, evolves over time. And so we want to be very, very thoughtful of that process. And again, what I'm trying to do here in my own mind, and hopefully successfully for you here today, is to how do we integrate these two powerful uh, evidence-based literatures? So what do we know about the teacher-student relationship? For some of you, if you happen to be on the line, and you also happen to be, am I still okay, Aaron, with that beep? Yep, it sounds like you're okay. Okay. Uh, I just heard a, a beep on my side, so I was yeah. always Someone ready for the tech on. Okay, I'm always ready for the technology to fail me. Yeah, well, um, I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this may some of this will be familiar to those of you who I saw in Central New York just a couple of weeks ago, but it's not precisely the same thing. And I think, in fact, uh, I I like this evolution of my thinking better than what I actually did just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, teacher-student relationships characterized by closeness, predict improved outcomes in academic performance, school adjustment, social skills and competence, and school engagement. Um, close teacher-child relationships and is an especially powerful predictor of improved outcomes for students who display behavior problems and for students of color uh, who are at risk, typically at risk. And unfortunately, um, uh, the reverse of the previous two observations is true when teacher-student relationships are characterized by conflict. Now, there's a temptation when we say this to say, to think, um, if I get the relationship right, good things will happen. But I, it, it's not that linear and it's not that causal, I don't think. I think the relationships are reciprocal. Um, I think um, 
when students fare well in our classrooms and they reward us for being a teacher by being responsive and learning, we are drawn to them. And it, it, so it's difficult to um, say which is the chicken and which is the egg in this relationship. We tend to, uh, you know, present this material and it encourages us to think, oh, get the relationship right and the academic achievement piece will, and the behavioral adjustment piece will ensue. Well, I think failure it isn't just that the relation, failure, failed relationships undermined academic achievement and behavioral adjustment. I think it's failure of academic achievement and behavioral adjustment also undermine the relationship because these students become less rewarding for the teacher and the exchanges between them around academics and behavioral expectations are less positive um, and positive exchanges happen less often. So I think the arrow between these variables, between re and among relation, between relationship and academic and behavioral outcomes, really points both ways. So I want to be careful about that. That it's more recursive than left to right causal. Um, an integrated model, therefore, might look like this. We have the, the basic uh, effective management and effective teaching from the more applied behavior analytical position. But the point of what we want to do today is we want to overlay or integrate with the positive teacher-student relationships as aspects of it um, in order to really maximize uh, student achievement. All right, so this is an articulation of uh, the evidence-based ABA approach to classroom management. This is essentially a categorical breakdown of uh, um, the effectiveness literature, the research base for uh, classroom procedures that have been uh, scientifically shown to lead to improved uh, behavioral and academic outcomes for students. Um, this particular summary, you'll see slightly different ones presented by uh, different people, but this is a summary, I believe, that I um, co-opted from uh, Brandy Simonson and Jen Freeman's work on this topic. Uh, they um, have done a lot of work in this area. In fact, have published a book in this area, uh, Simonson and Myers, Classified Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. So this is really just a summary of, of that. So if you've seen them present, if you've gone to the Northeast PBIS Behavior Conference or seen them anywhere else, um, they present this material frequently. And we could, in fact, spend the next hour together, um, and I, I have them in my possession. I use them in my teaching at the university, several slides on each of these bullets. Let's go through them and let's talk about each of them and let's unpack each of them. So there, but that's not really the point of today. Um, I think as a behavior specialist or as a thesis worker or whomever's on the phone who is uh, has as a charge supporting uh, school personnel's implementation of these procedures, you want that material in your repertoire. I have it. I don't know, Aaron, if the TAC has it. Um, if we have a classroom curriculum that is essentially an articulation of this material, but through me to Aaron, you, I can certainly make that stuff available to you. But uh, you know, uh, that is not what the ensuing slides are going to be. I'm not going to have four or five slides on classroom rules and four or five slides on classroom procedures and six class on says on the various approaches to uh, rewarding and encouraging expected behavior and so on down the list. Um, uh, I'm, again, the goal is to try and weave these into how when you do these things, can you also be mindful of and specifically endeavoring to use these strategies to cultivate positive teacher-student relationship. I will stop and take questions. Anything? Anybody? There's nothing in the chat right now, but if people wanted to take a moment to um, think about what Kevin just said and if you have any questions or comments, that was very good, Kevin. <laughs> very Thank good you. giving opportunities to respond. Thank and that was excellent <laughs> behavior specific <laughs> praise, Aaron. Thank, thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Got it. Gosh, aren't we collegial? Yes. <laughs> okay. It doesn't look like anyone has any questions right now. All right. I'm moving on. So the idea is how can these strategies improve both
parallel student behavior and positive teacher-student relationships. Um, oh, events. That's a spelling area. That should say evidence-based. I kind of like events, too, but that should say evidence-based approaches to establishing positive teacher-student relationships. So if we go back to this slide, again, these are very applied behavior analytic. Because they are have their roots in applied behavior analysis, each of these strategies on this slide um, that constitute uh, the evidence base for uh, effective classroom management strategies and supports um, meet all the requirements of applied behavior analysis. They are rooted in behavioral theory. They rely on um, operationalized definitions of uh, the intervention components as well as the behaviors to be treated and so on. When we advance the slide and we get into the evidence-based approach to establishing positive teacher relationships, the language gets far softer. But um, because the language gets far softer and we're not just um, uh, it, it, I felt the need to be uh, uh, more careful to give you the, um, the researchers who have actually identified these strategies. So suddenly we're talking about what is this thing called relationship, and how do, you know if you talk to a behaviorist, they will tell you. So operationally define relationship for me. What is it? Um, uh, so that we can objectively, reliably, and validly measure it. Well, it is a a bit of a moving target um, to uh, um, assess something as intangible as a relationship. But as um, good old Albert Einstein said all those years ago, well, I'm going to paraphrase him actually, um, not everything that matters uh, can be counted and not everything that, no, not everything that uh, uh, can be counted matters and not everything that matters can be counted. Um, so sometimes the, the phenomenon we're interested in pose some measurement issues, and I think in these in this softer area of relationships, um, uh, you'll notice the difference in language. Make an effort to get to know and connect with each student. Well, what does that look like? It's like art. We know art when we see it, but when we try to define what art is, um, it poses challenges. We know people. We know adults who make children comfortable, who make children feel like they are being seen and respected, um, uh, uh, right? And, and, and adults who connect readily and easily with, with children and with youth. Um, and we also know adults, frankly, who are stiffs, who are awkward, who don't connect readily. Um, but how do we um, deconstruct that into, um, can we teach that, or is it natural? And I think we're trying to move to towards a direction where we can, in fact, operationalize these constructs sufficiently so that teachers can be mindful of them and um, work as assiduously to uh, um, incorporate into their teaching behavior explicit attempts to nurture relationships just as explicitly as they attempt to incorporate into their teaching repertoire uh, techniques that are um, meant to shape explicit, well-defined behaviors. A related but slightly different phenomenon than relationship. Um, so the second one is make an, invita make an effort to spend time individually, um, especially with students who are difficult or shy. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of, and I didn't put it in the PowerPoint. I believe it's more anecdotal than empirical, but I believe it's called the 10 times 2 or 2 times 10 uh, approach where um, with a given student, uh, a teacher makes the effort to spend two minutes a day for 10 consecutive days talking with the student about anything that they wish um, in order to develop that relationship. Uh, again, I've seen lots of um, anecdotal testimony that it's a very powerful intervention. I've yet to read a study um, that specifically references the 2 times 10 or 10 times 2, whichever way people say it. But this research by Pianta and colleagues and other scholars as well um, is empirical support for that notion of spending time uh, individually with students. Um, be aware of your explicit
explicit and implicit messages you're giving to your students. Um, be careful, right? So it's really easy to communicate in um, subtle ways of which you are unaware um, that so certain students are held in high regard and certain other students are experienced with greater frustration and less warmth and less regard. And we need to self-regulate very carefully and self-reflect to make sure that, um, you know, it's those children who, uh, um, you know, we'll talk about this later, about um, remaining emotionally objective, um, uh, who need us. Um, what there's a phrase, you know, the students who need us to love them the most will ask for that love in the most unloving ways. Um, and so we really need to self-regulate our responses because many of our students are expert at putting us on the behavior pathway and the antecedent is their uh, troubled or toxic or frustrating behavior. And the B minus in this case is our display of frustration or rejection. Um, or contempt in in horrible cases or criticism um, that they are very good at provoking in us. And we need to do our best to self-regulate so that we don't communicate that to students. Uh, we need to create a positive climate in the classroom by not just focusing on our relationships with the students as the adults, but to also cultivate positive interactions between and among the students. And finally, um, I'm going to come back to one of the uh, most important things we can do as teachers is differentiate instruction so that each and every student in our classroom is a successful learner and uh, develops the, um, a sense of achievement and competence and mastery. And in fact, when we celebrate that growth with our students and we see that when they see that we work to ensure that we don't put them in failure uh, circumstances, frustration circumstances, humiliation circumstances, by asking them to do work for which they haven't mastered the necessary prerequisites. And instead, we program for success uh, by making database decisions about instruction, about differentiated instruction, and then we celebrate those successes with them. Those celebratory moments become the building blocks of that uh, positive regard for one another. Look at this thing that we've accomplished together, this endeavor we've undergone together, and we've reached a, um, uh, a certain uh, a positive outcome. And you know, a positive regard can can grow from those experiences. I would argue that effective, explicit, direct instruction that's data based and differentiated based on students' needs, so that they can be successful is the single most powerful behavior management technique teachers can acquire. Um, we don't typically think of good teaching as good behavior management, but I would argue it is. Um, and I would also argue, again, at the university, we graduate master students every year. In a good year, 40 or 50 of them. And I, I believe the most challenging thing we ask our graduates to learn how to do is to differentiate instruction for students who are non-responders um, to standard instruction. Uh, and uh, I think it's a very stressful thing that we ask teachers to do to be able to con accommodate uh, genuine academic heterogeneity within their classroom. So uh, now we're bouncing back over to sort of the ABA side, but also the relationship side. So as I go through these next slides, I'm going to try and use language that comes out of the relationship side, but also out of the ABA side. And, you know, again, if you're at the Central New York um, conference, some of this will look familiar to you. So, you know, I, yeah. Can I, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but a nope. question came up on the chat that I think is relevant to your last slide. Um, Irvin um, and Crusoe in New York City had a question about um, how do we assess that the relationship between students and teachers is especially important or predictor of improved outcomes from students of color? Um, Irvin, if, if hopefully I captured your question correctly, I can repeat it or I can figure out how to make sure that you get off of mute. I've, or just he can type yes, that's good yeah. enough. Yeah, and I've unmuted everyone, so if Irvin, oh, he said yes. So how do we assess that the relationship between students and teachers is especially important or a predictor of improved outcomes for students of color? 
higher. Um, I can certainly send you the, or put you in touch with those studies. The work that comes to mind for me is, again, Pianta's work. Um, he, he has a measure, developed a measure. Uh, he has two measures, really, um, and I'm not remembering. One's called the CLASS, and I'm not remembering the acronym for the CLASS, but it's an assessment of um, instructional environments, and it has three parts. One, uh, uh, one aspect of the CLASS assesses quality of instruction. In, the, in that classroom, one aspect of the class um, examines uh, environmental arrangements that are supportive of teaching and learning, and the third piece assesses uh, teacher-student relationship. Um, and um, they have another separate instrument uh, that the folks at Virginia have developed, and I can't remember the name of the instrument off the top of my head, but it is exclusively uh, rather than being one part of an instrument, um, as it is in the class, the entire instrument is a measurement of um, uh, teacher-student relationship. And so they have those two um, reasonably objective measures of what they're calling relationship. And, you know, when you look at, I, I haven't looked at the psychometric properties. I have looked at the psychometric properties of the class. They're very strong. The other instrument I haven't really looked at. And so you measure um, both teachers and students' perception of the relationship by asking them questions about it. And, and that's what the, the scales do is it's a Likert scale or Likert scale. I will never give up the name Likert for Likert, but I'm told that the person's name was Likert, so we should actually respect them right by using saying their name right. Um, and, and then the respondents, either the teacher or the student, answers a number of uh, questions about how they perceive the teacher does this for me, the teacher does that, is patient with me, is, uh, right, and so they call that a measure of relationship, right, and then they also measure academic and behavioral outcomes, and then they dig down into the data like we do with PBIS data, and they disaggregate the data along racial lines, um, and uh, then they can see that uh, there's a relationship uh, that youngsters of color do better when their relationship with their teacher is positive. Um, youngsters at risk for uh, emotional and behavior disorders do better when uh, the relationship between the teacher and the student isn't ruined by the toxic and uh, aversive behavior that the student brings to the relationship. So it really is just, um, you know, and then there are different statistical analyses that I'll one and not qualified to really go through, but you know the the way they address it. But that that's the research design is where um, these instruments is the uh, independent variable, and what the dependent measure or dependent variable is. How does student behavioral and academic success vary according to? their relationship with the teacher. Um, I could, you know, send you uh, links to those for those articles. If Just shoot me an email and I'll, um, some of it's referenced there. Um, but there's more work than Piantis that has showed that as well. Okay, that's fine. Does that work? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Was I heard? Interestingly, there's also, uh, it's equivocal research. But another interesting question is, um, if the teacher is a teacher of color, um, what is, to what extent does um, having the teacher uh, and the student sharing the same race or ethnicity uh, affect um, both relationship and then uh, the, the outcomes of interest, academic and behavioral? That's an interesting literature, too. And, um, uh, there's some uh, literature that suggests that when you get a match between the teacher and the student, uh, relationship is more likely to occur and uh, better outcomes are more likely to occur, but not always. So, um, as I said, those literature are somewhat equivocal from my read. Okay, I don't know, is that in your office, Aaron? Or is that as... Well, no, I think so that was just in urban. 
<laughs> okay. When, all right. He works in a busy office. Yes, it's all very right, so, in that school. <laughs> so this is part of my thinking. If we want students to take ownership of our rules and expectations, there has to be a logic for them with which they identify. Right, and uh, and we need to make that logic explicit. And so, part of the logic, you know, you, you, it's hard to make this case. You'd have to make it in a developmentally appropriate uh, way. You'd make the case for a five-year-old different than a fifteen-year-old. But the general purpose of this slide is to take a look at all the positive outcomes for both individuals and communities that educational success has an effect on. Um, literally saving students' lives, economic prosperity, um, uh, you know, the ability to feed people, socioeconomic status, uh, the status of women within a, um, a, a society, uh, uh, peacefulness, uh, physiological health are all have all been empirically shown to be related to uh, educational attainment of both individuals and the overall populace within different communities. So I envision this, the teaching and learning um, relationship, school, this perfunctory thing that we take for granted because everybody's been doing it forever, and instead try to reconceptualize it as this precious jewel, this equalizer of um, savage inequalities other places in society that, that is, is the doorway to opportunity. And so we have this precious jewel, this enterprise you're undertaking with students. And as the adult in the room or the adults in the room, it's, we have the responsibility to protect and nurture that, um, and, right? And so, um, you know, the, the circles are the long-term outcomes associated with academic attainment. And in this case, behavior, therefore, that undermines teaching and learning is a social justice inter uh, issue uh, because uh, when you make it difficult for me to teach, and you'll hear me say this a lot, when you make it difficult for me to teach and others to learn because you're choosing behaviors that are inconsistent with our values and rules, um, it creates a social injustice in the classroom. And I, my job is to give you feedback that you're doing it and to encourage you and support you in not doing it. That's what behavior management is. It isn't tickets to grow behavior. Yes, tickets to grow behavior is one strategy, but the way I conceptualize it is it has a firm values base, which I'll talk about it in a minute, and that we are growing healthy, peaceful, socially just communities where teachers can teach and students can learn. That's why we need rules and expectations so that I can do my best teaching and you can do your best learning so that you can have the best opportunities. And again, misbehavior that undermines teaching and learning is therefore a social justice issue because you're making it difficult for the teacher to teach and other students to learn. And um, in, in our classrooms, um, uh, there will be no social justice. All right. So because you've got me on the webinar and I feel like I have a, a, a fairly good handle on the applied behavioral analytic approach, but indeed I am not a dyed-in-the-wool behaviorist, you'll get softer language like this. This is my cohesive narrative, my mental model in my head about the enterprise we're undertaking when we're trying to support children and making good uh, uh, social and behavioral choices so that learning can occur. And so often at the beginning of a year, uh, I would recommend when you look at the ABA literature on school-wide and class-wide, it starts with um, you know, developing your three to five positive expectations, and then you create your be behavioral matrix, and then you engage in explicit instruction of the behavioral matrix across the various settings in the school. Well, before all that, I start with um, the contra somewhat controversial idea of values, right? And so in a classroom, all students have the right to learn in a safe environment, learn without distraction, be re treated with respect, have their property respected, have their individually individuality accepted. And in turn, I have the right to all of those things too as the teacher, uh, right? So th these are the values that we privilege in order um, to uh, provide a sound foundation for the teaching and learning enterprise that is going to follow. And so I make, 
I, I recommend making these explicit. This is the logic behind the rules, right? Building a community of learners based on values of social justice, fairness for all is the basis for rules, not adults needs to be authoritarians and be in control, right? That there's an enterprise here, and as the adult in the room, my job is to make sure we maximize the time we have together to produce the best outcomes for you so that you have the best opportunities. And when people make behavioral choices that interrupt that enterprise, it's again a question of social justice. Now, how you say that to a five-year-old versus a 15-year-old, but first, you got to get um, right, so and on the first day of school, if we look at the next slide, um, I should have moved that up, but I guess it's okay. Um, you know, to these are fairly non-controversial, and when the students are um, uh, on the first couple of days of school, and you're talking about them, and you're enjoying a bit of a honeymoon with them, and remember, remember when we talk about classroom values and doing this work, we expect the content of this slide, of this, of the presentation that we're sharing this morning, to be sufficient behavioral support for 80% of the kids. Right, so 80% of the kids are going to sit there and communicate what, yes, I think it's absolutely true that we should learn in a safe environment. And yes, we, I should be able to learn without being interrupted. And right, that these are values through dialogue, discussion, and interaction that you can uh, get students to show ownership of it. And the way they, they show ownership um, is, you know, after you've had the conversation, you have a little activity, and they come up. And they start to commit to, yes, these are the values that I will live by in this classroom. I'm committing to being a good community member, and I will um, be mindful of these values in the choices I make throughout the school year. And, of course, then in the end, I sign it too. And so here's our social contract. We're going to treat each other with dignity and respect. We are going to value instruction and learning. Um, we're going to value each of your individuality. This is a social contract. It's not a once-off that we do at the beginning of the school year and put up on the wall and never think of again. If I'm managing students' behavior in the moment, I am making direct reference to this document. However you articulate it, whatever your preference is, if you think my hands are cheesy and juvenile and won't work for eighth graders, then, then but conceptually the idea works. Make the social contract explicit and make the values that constitute the social contract explicit because now the rules and expectations have a logical basis of fairness and decency and um, safety, um, and right? And so that's why we have, and I think the kids need to know that, that they're not random rules. They need, they need to have a cohesive narrative in their mind about why we have rules. And again, if I put something like this up on the wall and um, one of my students is making choices that's inconsistent with my values, I'm going to reference these values as I manage the student's behavior. Not always, but under certain conditions. And if I don't run out of time before I run out of slides, which is my want, we'll see how that works. How are we doing on quite all right, so this is a more advanced it doesn't do everything, and it, it sort of conflates some of the things we've been talking about because some of these are rules and expectations, and some of these are values, but you can see that the teacher's making promises on the left hand side um and uh right, and some conflated in these are the values and the expectations in the previous discussion we deconstructed we talked about values leading to expectations. In this articulation, it's sort of, again, conflated, um, and uh, you can see that uh, Ms. Searman has really, this is her cohesive narrative in her head about how her classroom will work. This is the social contract she wants um, students to uh, accept, and um, she goes through this on the first day uh, of class. Now, if you're in a PBIS school, 
all of these things get broken down into lesson plans, and we use examples and non-examples to teach behavioral expectation. This is for, you know, do we need to do that for high school students in math? Um, uh, I think for some things we should make clear. Uh, we need to, you know, make sure that students are um, clear about what examples and non-examples are. But um, I think that that meticulous uh, teaching of behavioral expectations is probably more important for younger kids. And then you can see that down the bottom, uh, Ms. Searman uh, obtained Aaron Brewer's support. Um, um, both the teacher and the student have signed the social contract. And so into a folder goes the signed social contract for all. And now that um, each of these things have been made explicit, Mrs. Searman will be referencing these things should Aaron choose to make choices that are inconsistent with the values and rules on which the classroom is set up. And again, all of these things are in the service of an efficient and effective classroom in which instruction takes priority. Time is a valuable resource that doesn't get wasted because it impacts student learning outcomes, and learning outcomes are directly related to opportunity. So now we're back to rules and expectations uh, because there's a lot on the slide. I'm ignoring my little. You know, sometimes when you use a um, an approach to a slide, here I go digressing. Aaron, reel me back in. Um, there's too much space above the line. And you, and you waste all that space, so I'm not wasting it, um, right? So you know all these. Those of you who have been, I mean, if you're, you know, given this is cohort C, maybe some of this stuff is more familiar to you or less familiar to you, given um, what you were doing before you got hired to be a behavior specialist. But um, here are the basic expectations, the basic expectations around rules and expectations that we identify and teach three to five, that they're positively stated, easy to remember, publicly posted. Uh, in the classroom, we don't post anything that's inconsistent or uh, incongruent with the school-wide expectations. They are then directly taught using explicit instruction. And there are, uh, you know, if this were a different PowerPoint, the next slide would be the lesson plan for teaching behaviors. Uh, this isn't that presentation, so we're not going to do that. Um, and then we teach directly using positive and negative examples. Uh, so that's both the teacher is explicitly clear where the line in the sand is. This is acceptable. This is unacceptable. And once the teacher is mindful and perfectly explicit in his or her mind about what his or her behavioral expectations are, only then can the teacher make um, those expectations explicit to the students. And so your standard examples, I don't know how many of you have taken uh, schools through new team training or tier one training, but they'll label for the, the leadership team that comes to the training will labor for an hour to come up with be safe, be responsible, and be respectful. They'll generate all kinds of ideas or respect others, respect property, respect self. And you can see how these are consistent with the values, the social contract that we signed within the classroom. And of course, there are more clever examples where teacher, where schools use acronyms and so on to articulate what their behavior expectations are. But again, it's uh, always critical to tie behavior expectations, our rules and expectations to values, um, and, and that they, and the value is this, they allow teachers to do their best teaching and students to do their best learning and everyone to be respected and safe. These values are the basis not only for rules and expectations, but they are um, the, uh, the basis for um, growing and sustaining positive teacher-student relationships, too. We'll see how that works. And then once we have the broad school-wide, this is just your basic behavioral matrix. Uh, I'm sure many of you, or hopefully all of you, have seen one before. But you've got your routines. There's not very many of them. There's only four. Starting the day, entering the classroom, working independently, and asking for help. Um, and we have specific behavioral expectations for each of those routines. I, I don't probably a real typical school day has far more routines than that, but you get the gist. And you can see that up top, what the school-wide expectations are, and then um, what the school-wide expectations look like in the nitty-gritty routine of starting the day, entering the classroom, working independently, asking for help. So the behavioral matrix might, in fact, 
um, have more types of routines. And here's, I won't claim that this uh, list of types of routines and activities that comprise the school day is exhaustive and complete, but it, it's close. I've seen a whole bunch of these lists, and you can add other things to them. But these are the types of things that students do every day in schools, and teachers typically are fuzzy in their mind about what it will look like if these things happen perfectly, what it will look like if these things aren't perfect but they're good enough, what it will look like if these things are so disorganized that I find them troubling, and what it will look like if these things are a disaster and chaos ensues, right? We've got this arc of from perfection to chaos, and somewhere is the line that we call good enough. Um, about how these things transpire uh, in a day in such a way that um, they're efficient and effective and support use of time uh, so that we maximize students' academic engage time and maxim in turn maximize student learning outcomes. So there's a reasonable list of the types of things students might, teachers might have students doing on a daily basis, and the, the charge that teachers have is to make these things first explicit in their own mind, um, you know, to develop their own list that they believe is a comprehensive list of uh, what their students will be doing in their classroom, and uh, and uh, then to make their expectations clear in their mind about what good enough, where's the line between good enough and unacceptable. It's easy to distinguish perfect from chaos. The real question is, where's the line between, you know, if you go a little bit to the right, that's unacceptable. If you go a little bit to the left, that's good enough. Where is that line? And I don't believe, I think as teacher, as institutions that prepare teachers, I think we throw teachers out into the profession without ever uh, training them and teaching them and educating them about how to engage in this mental process on their own, and then therefore their expectations for these things um, evolve haphazardly as their students enter the classroom, and if they start to lurch towards chaos, only then does the teacher start to think, oh my God, this isn't right. Only then do they consciously think about this is unacceptable. The idea here is, is that you're proactively doing this, clarifying in your own mind, so that you can then ex um, um, make those expectations explicit uh, for your students through direct instruction. And so what do we mean about expectations? Well, here's a nice little list. I believe I stole this from Sprick and his book. What is his book? Champs. Um, uh, Sprick has, has said, okay, so for any activity, there's going to be expectations about uh, talking. Uh, so for each of those items on the list up top, what's your expectation for talking? So you get the teacher, you give them a guide, it's a cognitive roadmap. What's your expectation for talking? Um, I don't know as behavior specialists if any of you have been in classrooms with teachers who think of none of this, and the classroom is chaotic, and you get called in to, act, to provide them with behavioral support so they in turn could uh, uh, manage their classroom better. And you walk in and you think to yourself, um, the teacher's not mindful of any of these things. Um, and as a result, it has gotten loose in here, and um, uh, to the point where it's disconcerting. I certainly have been in those classrooms. I've been in classrooms where children talk with impunity in ways that are highly disruptive of instruction, and the teacher has no idea how to engage a student who is talking with impunity um, uh, because they don't, uh, you know, they've tried to use adult authority to scold the child into compliance, and the child just kind of looks at them and smiles and says, oh, please. Right, so they don't know what to do next. Um, what would getting help look like uh, uh, in any of those activities? If, you're, if a student's engaged in a transition or lining up or peer tutoring or uh, independent work or whole group instruction, what is the mechanism for getting help? The teacher teaches that explicitly. What will completing the task um, appropriately look like when you're done? What does lining up look like when you line up um, perhaps not perfectly, but well enough. Um, what does a uh, cooperative learning group look like when the activity is completed? Uh, what, 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 what's the fruition of that activity look like? What's a good outcome, what's not? What, do, what are your movement expectations? Again, I'm mindful, I had a poor intern who was in a classroom um, where the students moved with impunity during lessons, and they would switch seats, 
um, and they would um, walk up, get up, and walk over to cupboards to access materials in the middle of the lesson. Um, they were allowed to indulge every movement impulse they had, and it clearly distracted. And the, the gentleman who ran that classroom was a lovely man who cared very much about his kids, but had never thought one whit about these things that we're talking about today. Had never specific the 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 negotiation uh, for the, what the your the climate of a teacher's classroom will be for a school year begins the first second of the first day of the school year, and you can either be mindful of that and exert uh, explicit mindful um, uh, teaching experiences about what your expectations are, or you can be worried about having your geography lesson ready and your math lesson ready and your uh, acad all your academics in order and pay no mind to this, and it will find its own level. And if you're a lucky teacher and your kids are well socialized and they, under they value school and, um, and you don't do any of these things we're talking about, your classroom will still work okay because the kids know how to do their part at school. But if you're in a – though your classroom won't be as efficient and effective as it might have been um, – or could be. Um, on the other hand, if um, you're working uh, with, with groups of students who are less socialized and have, are less fluent in uh, displaying and maintaining behaviors that we generally are, agree to are productive and appropriate for being in school, and you don't do these things, classrooms get out of control and out of hand. And I've been in many, many, many of them where the teacher is completely overwhelmed and has no idea uh, about how to reel it back in and, and um, has never been exposed to this material that we're talking about. So again, routines, what does it mean? Uh, what are my expectations? And Sprick very thoughtfully said, well, you can make your expectations explicit across these five variables, talking, getting help, completing the task objective, movement, and participating for each of those activities. Questions? I don't see anything in the chat now, but let's give people just a minute. That was a... Um a lot of material and hopefully you're thinking about how you can incorporate this in your professional development with your teams and with your um, the teachers that you work with. Do you have any questions if you're thinking about um, how to deliver um, these messages that Kevin's talking about or the ways that we would model this um, these specific behaviors that um, Kevin was just referring to? I don't see any questions, so if anyone has any questions or you're still reflecting, just go ahead and type them in the chat box and I'll um, bump in, but I think we're all set, Kevin. All right. So we know a lot about how we teach these expectations. We do it in the first day, the first week, the first month of school. Um, this is an explicit negotiation of the classroom climate. It's wedded to our values. Um, the rules that we're teaching, we never lose sight of those values about why we have these expectations. So our best teaching and our best learning can occur. So what do we know about teaching expectations? We know that students learn appropriate social behavior um, following the exact instructional procedures um, uh, that we use to teach reading and math and um, uh, other academic subjects, and that is through instruction, practice, feedback, and encouragement. And right in here is probably a, um, um, a, a little uh, series of observations that uh, many of you have seen before, but I think it's profound. If a student doesn't know how to read, we teach. If a student doesn't know how to swim, we teach. If a student doesn't know how to multiply, we teach. If a student doesn't know how to behave, what do we do? We punish. Well, no, we teach. Um, and why is it so hard for us to arrive at the conclusion that we teach when we think about social behavior rather than, and why, you know, we don't um, find it irritating that a student can't swim. Um, and we just think, oh, they need the opportunity to learn. And why with social behavior are we less inclined to think that when, in fact, that's the very truth and that's what this um, all of these practices are meant to support doing. Um, uh, teaching behavioral expectations is a multi-step approach, and so I had to start high on the slide again. Make precise characteristics of acceptable 
behavior explicit in your own mind. You can't teach what you're not clear about yourself. So that crystallized vision in your own mind's eye of what your behavioral expectations are for each of the routines. And again, in a PBIS school, you go to PBIS.org, you download the teaching behavioral expectations lesson plan, and you fill it out, and it, it encourages you. It, it becomes a cognitive roadmap uh, to guide you through the instructional process. Um, you define the expectations verbally and relay it back to your values because we're never straying far from that because, again, we want to commute. This isn't an authoritarian thing. This is a social justice thing. We want to provide the rationale, um, again, tying to values. Then you teach the critical discrimination, the heart and soul of explicit instruction for any topic, including social behavior, is um, the old I do some while you watch, we do some together, you do some by yourself. The fancier language is that for that is modeling guided practice and independent practice. Uh, some people call it model lead test, but that is the heart and soul, the very backbone of explicit instruction. I will model some for you. Um, I will model a range of examples and non-examples. The students will then role play a full range of examples. So they're seeing in their mind, where's that line in the sand? Not too bad, but not good enough. Okay, that's acceptable. right? Again, it's easy to, to distinguish between perfect and uh, chaos. Where What's difficult is, and what we need to train our minds to do, is look at the line about where is my criteria of acceptable performance? What's good enough? What will I accept? Of course, once you teach it, that's talking the talk, walking the walk, is showing up every day and holding account, kids accountable for what you just taught them. And we'll get into that mindfulness that's necessary to be able to do that. There's some controversy about um, the fourth bullet is there, students role-playing non-examples. In the literature, you'll see admonitions that students ought not practice the non-examples. Um, I have, and, and that has some intuitive face value. I've never seen a lick of empirical work that says if students get to model the non-examples, they are more likely to engage in non-examples in the future. In my uh, experience, students really enjoy the non-examples. They have fun doing it. Um, there's often laughter associated with it. Um, and they can be clever at designing non-examples. And if you challenge a student to say, show me a wildly unacceptable non-example. Now show me an example that is almost good enough, a non-example that is almost good enough, but not quite. Um, and they, they, love, they like that mindfulness, and it helps create in their mind a clarity of where the line in the sand is. So I'm not one of those who's going to admonish you to say and say, don't let the students do the non-examples. Um, I have found it in my own clinical, my own applied experience working with kids, um, an enjoyable part of the process for everybody. Discuss with your students upcoming opportunities to use what was just practiced. Remind them that if you just did whole group instruction, remind them that you know we do whole group instruction at three or four times a day. Um, here are the times that we're going to be doing it. So you're doing giving them a preset of this thing that we just practiced. I expect you to generalize to real life in uh, somewhere down the line. Uh, when we encounter these opportunities to use these behaviors we've just practiced for this particular routine, um, let's let's start to create a mindfulness about when those situations pop up so that you recognize them for what they are and can self-regulate and say, oh, yeah, my teacher taught me what to do for these routines. If you don't recognize the stimulus in the environment that's it, that 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 announces to you, hey, that behavior you, the teacher taught you, now's the time you're supposed to learn it, um, that moment can slide by without entering a student's conscious awareness. And so they don't generalize the behaviors you taught them because they don't recognize the moment in time as an opportunity to, to use them. So we sort of start to prime the pump by listing the ideas uh, or the opportunities that are coming up in the future. Um, and then you tell the students, I'm going to give you a pre-correction. Uh, I hope everybody's familiar with pre-corrections. I don't think I have a definition anywhere in the slide, but it's a quick restatement of the behavioral expectations that you just taught right before you give the directive to engage in the behavior. So it goes pre-correction directive. Um, right? So in this instance, you tell the students to 
to help you recognize the moment in time when you need to use these behaviors we just taught, I'm going to give you this antecedent stimulus. Would you use the words antecedent stimulus? No, but that's what it is. It's an antecedent intervention that's intended to increase the likelihood that you get compliance with behavioral expectations. So you tell them what your part's going to be. So you know what that means? You can't be mindless either. You have to recognize the moment coming. You have to self-regulate as teacher, and you have to alloc allocate this antecedent behavioral support that increases the likelihood of student compliance. If you are overwhelmed by other things, if you are distracted, you know, one, this is a sort of social contract, right? Here's what I'm preaching you. It's tied to our values. We've practiced them. We're all perfectly clear about where the line in the sand is. Here's how I'm going to support you to make a good choice to stay on the right side of the line in the sand, all right? Then you support independent practice by actually issuing the pre-correction, and then you reinforce compliance with expectations consistently. So every time you get what, right, particularly at the beginning of the year, um, if any of you are discrete trial trained, right, uh, for kids with typically with autism or, or, or students with um, intellectual disabilities, and, and we talk about a trial, a trial is present the antecedent have the learner, the student, engage in the behavior with, ever, with whatever type of prompt is necessary for them to complete the behavior successfully, and then dish out the reinforcement, right? So in our minds, a good teacher is always mindful. Right now, I'm in, in the ABC sequence. Right now, I'm doing the A. Now, here's the student's opportunity to do the B, and now I'm doing the C. I'm offering the affirmation, the praise, and, um, and the acknowledgement, which... Um, might be in the form of social praise or a token economy, depending on what kind of system you have set up. Um, if you're a PBIS school and you really have the ticket system humming, um, which in my experience is one of the more challenging parts to get schools to engage in reliably and consistently, um, uh, there may be tangible rewards that you're dishing out when you catch kids being good. Um, and then we want to correct noncompliance. You're going to be fully present in the moment. You're going to be scanning your classroom. You're going to be engaging in what's the term I want, um, active supervision. You, you're moving around the classroom. You're scanning your kids. You're mindful in the moment. You observe for those students who are uh, meeting the criteria of, ex of, of uh, acceptable performance that you taught them, and you're going to systematically lay it on nice and thick with reinforcement for them. And when you make an observation that a kid comes up on the wrong side of the line in the sand that you drew, you're going to correct them in a very non-reinforcing way. Uh, what else? All right, so there's just your model, the heart and soul of um, modeling and exploitation, guide to practice and to practice, and that's your, your basic explicit instruction. And um, If any of you have a background in reading, this approach to explicit instruction is the, the behavioral approach to instruction, um, uh, and it is dominant within special education as an approach to instruction. Of course, in literacy, there's also the whole language group who hate this approach to instruction, uh, don't believe that it's constructivist and so on. Uh, but um, we, behave, you know, folks who, who adhere to behavioral principles um, can see their application in the real world and are consciously aware of. I'm engaging in an antecedent support right now. I'm observing the quality of my student's behavior, and I'm contingently regulating my reaction to that behavior. And I'm in, in turn, I'm using differential reinforcement. I'm reinforcing kids in a nice, thick schedule. Um, who are who are complying, I'm not going to take compliance for granted. And I will tell you right now, I believe teachers, all of us, in fact, are hardwired to take compliance for granted and to react to squeaky wheels. And uh, it is, it takes um, measured self-reflection to self-regulate in the moment and, and uh, make a professional commitment to uh, acknowledge pro-social behavior uh, far more frequently than you redirect um, and scold uh, unacceptable behavior. Um, so one of the first times, the, probably the directive for which we expect compliance most is give me your attention to the students, the, the directive to attend to me. I am going to engage in teaching behaviors.
attending to me will be critical to you knowing what to do when it's your turn, right? Um, if you're not attending to me, you're not going to see the antecedent supports I put in place for you. You're not going to uh, experience the way I've organized the environment for you so that it, you can be successful either academically or behaviorally when it's your turn to act. So we, I'm in classrooms all the time, and for many teachers, the attention getting cue is I start to talk. Um, I don't think that's a very effective attention getting to uh, tool. I sometimes use it with my, I actually have a little experiment. I haven't told my students this semester, but some weeks I say to them, I walk to the front of the room. They're all yakking with each other, right? They're all sitting there and they're eating their Chipotle and their Subway sandwiches because they, they're just coming from having spent a full day in the public schools. And uh, on some weeks, and, and it's a little sort of experiment I'm doing, informal experiment. I walk to the front of the room and I say, my attention getting signal is every time I choose to do it, let's get started. And then I measure latency, how long before they shut up and give me their attention. And at other times, I just put the first slide up and I start talking and I watch for their latency. And when I go to the front of the room and I say, okay, let's get started, the latency is far shorter than if I just start in on the content. Um, and so I believe, uh, right, here's the, again, a juvenile one um, for elementary school, but these are, when I give you my attention getting cue, um, uh, here's a standard one that you see, but you can see many. Uh, some people use a clapping noise. Other people, you know, there's there's any number of ones, uh, antecedent signals that we knew that we use to communicate to the students. Attend to me. Um, the silly little story I often tell about this one is uh, the teacher I was trained with, who I worked with, who was demonstrating these principles. I was observing in her class. This was when I was a doc student. I was a doc student. I had to go observe a teacher who had bought into all these procedures that we're, we've been discussing, and I could go see them in action in a classroom as part of my doctoral studies. So I was in her classroom for a couple weeks, a couple times a day, and her attention-getting cue, she would say this, I told me. And for, I don't know, a month, I thought to myself, oh, she has a cute little French phrase in order to get the student's attention. Eyes on me. I wonder what eyes on me means. Of course, she was saying eyes on me. Um, uh, so, you know, I, we are all vulnerable to the world of symbols. It was quite embarrassing when I asked her, what does eyes on me mean? And she looked at me like, what do you mean? What does it mean? Here's the rub on this. This is crucial. Systematically teach and shape compliance with this directive by reinforcing it when you get it and correcting it when you don't. The teacher needs to be mindful in the moment. I've just given a directive to attend to me. I now need to be present in the moment and scan and recognize those students who, have it, who are giving me their attention in the way that I've taught them to. And who, this is a routine, by the way, that you teach. It's a very brief routine. Look at me, attend to me, and then correcting students who don't. You go into a classroom, I guarantee you, you will see teachers either implicitly or explicitly ask for students' attention, get partial attention from partial group, and then give the next directive. When you do that, you are negotiating with students that your directives are negotiable, are suggestions. You know, if you guys think it's a good idea, attend to me. It's okay if you don't, because I'm moving on without dealing with it if you don't. Right? So the most frequent directive you will give all year, or a teacher will give all year, is the directive to attend to me. Compromise on this directive, and you'll send a signal to your students that you'll compromise on all expectations and directives. Right? So self-regulating through the moment that when I give that directive to attend to me, to be fully present in the moment, to scan the room, to engage in um, active supervision so that I can systematically start to build my four to one, five to one, eight to one repertoire on catch them being good versus scolding the non-compliers. That every time I give a directive, it's an opportunity to build the affirmations, reinforcements, and rewards on that four to one, five to one, eight to one schedule, whatever you're trying to achieve. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Questions? Anything? 
I don't see anything yet. I think you're all set to keep going. All right. So we know a lot about how to catch them being good, providing that positive praise. It follows the if-this-then rule. You've got in your mind's eye, you know what that criteria of acceptable performance is, what we've been calling the line in the sand. You're vigilantly observing the quality of your student's behavior to see if it meets um, expectations or comes up short of expectations. And so you react to those behaviors differentially when they do and when they don't, um, and or in what some People would say contingently, when students meet that criteria of acceptable performance, you mindfully dole out um, uh, praise uh, as soon as possible afterwards. If the uh, behavior is ongoing, then you can, pra if it's a duration behavior, then you praise during the behavior. It includes the student's name, its behavior is descriptive, um, simply describe what the student is doing at the time. It's convincing, uh, it's varied, it's not cheesy, it's not saccharine, uh, it's non disruptive, and good praise is delivered far more frequently than our corrections, calls, and redirections. I think here's where I say praise inflation. When I started teaching this stuff, Everywhere it was four to one. And by the way, that four to one ratio, I defy you to find a study that says you get better outcomes when it's four to one. Um, it's all intuitive. Then I started seeing uh, praise inflation, and it was five to one. And I've recently seen a, ref a recommendation for eight to one. Um, but not only are these, right, so in an ABA model, if, you know, I give a directive, I get compliance, I reinforce it. There's your A, your B, your C that you're trying to make come to life naturalistically in your day-to-day -day interactions with students. It not only shapes that student's behavior and strengthens it, it is a mechanism towards which the two of you are celebrating little victories and cementing your relationship with the student. Now, we have all of those bullets, but I would argue praise can sometimes be a student is working quietly and hard at their desk, and all they get from you is a look, and you smile, and there's a look in your eyes that says, yes, I see you doing the right thing. Nice job. And never a word gets said, but the communication is undeniable. Now, before you can get to that, I would absolutely recommend the steps on this slide, making it explicit. Don't leave it to chance that the student has no idea what that smile meant. Um, but you can get to the point uh, where good praise is walking past the student as you engage in active supervision, tapping their desk and, say, and simply saying, uh, really nice job. Because you've taught what the behavioral expectation is, Right, and you've made it explicit, it's implied, of course, because I'm not saying the whole thing, that, oh, look, you're doing a good job behaving in a way that's consistent with our values when you choose to um, use the correct approach to getting help. Might you say all that at the beginning of the year? Sure. Uh, do you want to have to do that every time you get praise? Probably not. Um, you know, so I, I think that smile, uh, that, you know, that tapping the desk and giving them the thumbs up, those count in your four to one, five to one, eight to ones. Um, responding to infrequent errors, um, all I want to do is reteach in the moment. When a student comes up short of the line in the sand and I make the discrimination that that behavior uh, is unacceptable, I get the student's attention. And here you can conflate these next two bullets. I typically leave the second bullet out. Um, if I've done a really good job teaching behavioral expectations and I believe my students know what the expectations are, but in a mindless sort of way engaged in behavior that was inconsistent with the expectation I taught, and I believe that the student doesn't need me to say the expectation first before I say the ex ask them to say the expectation, I go right to uh, say, um, ask the student. If you think the student needs you to model it first, to model it first. If, um, if when the student says it and then shows it, there's one of your four to ones. Now you're doing a good job. Well done. I really like the way you got started. Responding to chronic errors, students who are perpetually making the same mistakes. Um, so you got to reteach. You got to take them back out and redo the lesson plan in a small group. Um, with more examples, more practice, more explanation of the values and rules. This is a, you know, the message to the student is, you're not getting on my last nerve, 
It's not that I think you're a bad person. It's not that I think you lack character. It's that you just haven't learned yet, so I need to reteach. Um, and that sometimes happens. Sometimes, you know, uh, people need some people need more practice before they get a skill down pat. My job is to give you the instruction you need to get the skill down pat. So I'm, you know, I'm going to take you aside during a quiet moment, and I'm going to reteach the expectation for these types of activities to you. Uh, through that instruction, you're going to still model, uh, you know, model guided practice and independent practice. You're going to tie it to the values, and you're going to reinforce that social contract with the student by setting explicit goals for making a good choice. You're going then to make sure that you really deliver that um, pre-correction, um, and you might deliver that pre-correction standing right next to the student, um, giving, uh, using what we call, pairing it with what we call proximity control. All right, so the pre-correction is a stimulus prompt, an antecedent prompt that uh, comes before the directive to engage in the behavior. The prompt is a response prompt. The behavior is going astray, and now I need to interrupt the error responding and provide scaffolding in the morning. So I think, I, again, that's a nice discrimination for you as instructors to be able to help your teachers make. The pre-correction is what I do before the directive, and therefore it's a stimulus prompt. The, the, uh, the verbal engagement that I engage in while the behavior is um, uh, existing is a response prompt. I've already seen that I'm, the student isn't uh, making the grade, so I, I interject myself um, to interrupt that error responding. And I correct the student immediately. I don't ignore. I'm calm, efficient, and businesslike. Um, I, ref I might remind them of the goals they set. Um, and if that doesn't work, right, if all of that antecedent support and uh, in-the-moment prompting support doesn't work, then we might consider something like a behavior contract or check-in, check-out, where we can then let a student know um, we can inc incentivize them by um, uh, letting them know, reminding them that making a good choice will lead to them earning all of their points or what, or their check or however we set the incentive up. Whatever it is they're working for, good choices will result in them uh, earning what it is that they decided they wanted to work towards, uh, choosing behaviors that are inconsistent with values will be them choosing uh, not to earn the reinforcements and rewards that you negotiated with them. Uh, the language in that is key, as we'll see in a minute about how we do that. So we've sort of gone through these things now. We've, we've stayed in the ABA world for a while. I've only tangentially mentioned the relationship part of that, but I hope you can see that in that. If you tie all of that to values, if uh, you make it explicit frequently and over and over again for your students that you are a neutral, neutral umpire, I think I'm going to... Um, getting ahead of myself, that you can, you're beginning to see that these are also strategies that don't just lead to strengthening the frequency and the intensity and duration of discrete social behaviors in students. They are also strategies that begin to uh, affect the nature of the relationship between the teacher and the student, right? And that if these supports are provided in a very positive way, um, through which the teacher is very careful to self-regulate any communication of frustration or disappointment or judgment um, that, um, in fact, if these strategies are positive behavioral supports, that we are systematically growing the relationship, not just systematically growing desired, discrete desired behaviors. So how can these management strategies improve both student behavior and positive teacher-student relationships? So. Um, Marzano, you know, I've been drawn increasingly to this stuff that Marzano and Marzano does. And frankly, you know, how you can be in this business for this long. I was unfamiliar with their work, but um, I like a lot, a, lot of, a, a lot of what I'm finding in their work. Um, but a quote from them, the quality of teacher-student relationships is the keystone for all other aspects of classroom management. And I genuinely believe that the technologies, the strategies, the supports that we just the class-wide behavioral supports based on the ABA approach that we just discussed become exponentially more powerful when they are delivered in the context of a positive teacher-student relationship. If the relationship deteriorates, the student comes to perceive our attempts to nurture and support as acts of hostility instead of acts of nurturing and support. Right? They, they get, they, they get an expectancy 
jealousy bias, a cognitive bias that you are a hostile adult and they associate you with always correcting them and right and we want to not let that be we, we want it um that not to be the outcome that we um uh, end up with and so the, the uh, a fairly new construct for me that maybe many of you are familiar with but um I found fascinating because it res resonated with many of my biases and beliefs was this idea of mental sets. I mean, I've heard of mental sets before. And I've been talking about, um, you know, cohesive narratives in your mind's eye for a long time, which is nothing more than a mental set. But let's take a look at what this mental set is and its relationship to relate to both delivering effective behavioral supports while simultaneously using that the, the delivery of those supports as a mechanism for cultivating positive relationships. The teacher's mental set. How about this? It's a heightened sense of situational awareness and a conscious control over one's thoughts and behaviors relative to that situation. Right? No teacher drift, no mindful drift, no no teacher coma. Right? You're fully present in the moment. Um, and you're consciously self-regulating yourself. Uh, easy to say, difficult to do, because this frame of mind is not easy to cultivate because it requires sustained engagement of so-called working memory, short-term memory. And the human brain is predisposed to focus on a very narrow range of stimuli and to operate quite automatically relative to those stimuli, right? In fact, that's what a habit is. And so as human beings, in order to... Um, uh, be efficient and effective and uh, save psychological energy, we develop habits so that we don't have to actively process every bit of information. We, ha we, we develop uh, behaviors that a uh, cognitive psychologist might say that we engage in them with automaticity. And automaticity means um, my delivery of this behavior um, involves access only of long-term memory and behavioral output. I don't need to engage short-term working memory to do this right. And so here's an example. If you're reading uh, fluff on the beach in the summer, um, as you're reading, you're reading um, uh, and your comprehension and your enjoyment of the text doesn't require very active use of working memory. It's um, long-term memory and behavioral output. On the other hand, if you're reading a technical book, um, for instance, our students uh, take a class here on multiple and severe disabilities that is loaded with me uh, medical jargon and um, technological devices that are multisyllabic and foreign and uh, esoteric to the profession. And when they read that, they have to engage in working memory to actively decode the words and actively assess my understanding what I'm reading. Do I get it? Can I attach what I've just read and the new knowledge and, and comprehend what was said here? Is it consistent with what I already know? Uh, how can I attach it so that I'll be able to remember it later? All of that has to be very active. If you can think about being with a friend, you know who a friend is? A friend is somebody you don't have to engage working memory around. You can just quote, unquote, be yourself, right? You don't have to self-regulate. And you know what? If you screw up and make a social faux pas, they might laugh at you, but it'll be too late laughter and you have a good laugh at yourselves, and you know that those people don't define you by that mistake. Whereas when you're with somebody who you don't trust and with whom you feel vulnerable, you've got your game face on, you're engaged in working memory. You're fully present in the moment. You're watching them like a hawk. You are uh, carefully observing their behavior. You're in actively interpreting it in your mind, right? Um, that sort of vigilance is psychologically exhausting to stay in that place for long periods of time. So what do we do? What's our preference? Is we choose to hang out with people with whom we don't have to do that. <laughs> we call them friends, right? And if and if uh, we have to do that other kind of work when we're with, the, when we're with them, they cease being friends. Um, right? So in this instance, what we're asking teachers to do is engage tenaciously in uh, uh, staying with that mental set. 
so that they can self-regulate their behavior, be consciously aware of the cognitive narrative in their head about what they're trying to achieve with regard to behavior management and relationship development, and make contingent choices of their, in their teaching behavior based on what, that which they very carefully observe in the classroom. The opposite of mental set is mindlessness. Um, mindfulness suddenly has come out of the woodwork and it's everywhere you turn. That is, we typically do not attend well to all of what is happening around us. We've all had the experience, right, of having driven somewhere expertly with no memory of having driven at all, right? Because we drive with automaticity. We are so fluent at it that we don't need to engage working memory to do it. If teachers have habits of not being mindful of student behavior, then um, they are driving their classroom like we drive um, a, a car when we drive with uh, out engaging working memory. Put a little ice and snow on the road and suddenly driving becomes a task in which we engage working memory. And because working memory can only deal with a few variables at a time, um, what happens when you're driving on snow and ice? The radio gets turned off. You tell the person next to you to shut up. Right? Because that's too much stimuli. I don't need it. I'm using all of my working memory. I can't listen to the song. I can't hear, listen to you babble on next to me. All of my psychological and mental energy is going into self-regulatory behavior to make sure that we don't get killed on snowy roads. Well, guess what? In the classroom, is driving a snowy road. Be vigilant and present in the moment. This stuff excites me. I like the behavior stuff. This excites me. Um, parts of mental sets are um, maintaining what's called with itness. And yes, that's a, a, you know, it's sort of an informal term, but it's actually a term from the literature that has been systematically studied. And um, another subset of uh, the mental set is self-exhibiting emotional uh, uh, objectivity. So remaining with it is um, aware of what is happening in all parts of the classroom, what on the behavioral side we call active supervision by continuous scanning the classroom even when individual even when you are working with small groups or individuals, you're poking your head up on a regular basis, you're assessing what you're seeing and you're determining what you need to react to and what you don't need to react to. In fact, um, they're also demonstrating this witness to your students so that your students know that you are with it. Because when students believe that you're mindless, they think there's the opportunity to engage in behaviors because you won't be there providing the role of neutral empire or to give them feedback and to scaffold their better choices. And so if they don't believe that you're mindful of their uh, behavioral choices, they may well be willing to make behavioral choices that are inconsistent with the expectations that you're taught. When we're mindful, oops, sorry. Um, it minimizes timing errors. Errors That means getting to a uh, behavioral uh, circumstance too late, and it minimizes target areas. Sometimes um, in basketball, um, there's a rule of thumb in football, too. Uh, the person who gets the uh, foul or the penalty is the person who acts second, right? The person who engages in the first transgression, uh, the referee, and in the classroom, the teacher, uh, who is invigilant doesn't get recognized. Um, but the response to that um, does catch the teacher's attention. So in basketball, it's very clear it's the person who retaliates that gets the foul, oftentimes. Um, though, in the, you know, now, that, now that, wouldn't it be nice to have um, uh, instant replay slow-mo for the classroom so that you could like, well, hold on, I've got to go to the video to see what happened here. But uh, the way they do in sports now, but um, we don't do that, so we don't want to make target errors. And when we're uh, with it and in the classroom, I'll, I'll show you the next slide is pretty interesting about that. Exhibiting emotional objectivity, on the other hand, and notice it doesn't just say having emotional objectivity, because the fact of the matter is none of us have emotional ob objectivity. Well, I do, but that's because I'm a fully self-actualized person who resides perfectly atop Maslow's hierarchy. If you look at the pyramid, that's me standing right at the top. Um, I, I, I hope you're at least smiling to that, um, and you're not saying, yes, we know you are an egomaniac, Kevin, so that we already knew that about you. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is we all experience a wide variety of emotional reactions to any number of things. The 
exhibiting emotional activity is the public face that we show. Um, sometimes we are in fact calm, and sometimes we're agitated, but we don't show it. So the word exhibiting is critical there, because the expectation is you are not a bad teacher if you churn inside. You are probably not being as effective as you might be if that churning comes to place from which your response comes, if you communicate that emotional distress to your students through criticism or contempt or sarcasm. And we'd like to think that those things don't exist in schools, but they exist far too much in subtle ways and not subtle ways. So this refers to the ability of the teacher to be persistent with all the elements of effective management, everything we've talked about, by not interpreting violations of rules and procedures, negative reactions to disciplinary interventions, and rebuffs to my authority um, as personal attacks that incense us. All right, so sometimes, so first of all, people used to say when I worked with kids with EBD, oh, you must be so patient. And I would think, no, I'm not really patient. I've just redefined what bothers me. So when a child was noncompliant, I didn't find it irritating. I genuinely thought about it as a teachable moment. Um, I wasn't a particularly pers patient person when I got emotionally activated. Uh, did I learn to self-regulate? I did, because I knew I had a, pro a professional obligation to do it, particularly working with kids with EBD who aren't happy until they have you in emotional distress. Um, and so part of my professional obligation was to not display that emotional distress because that was part of their self-fulfilling prophecy of see how adults are. And then I dedicated myself to being that neutral umpire, even if I was feeling the desire to throttle some little so-and-so who got on my last nerve. Might some so-and-so get on your last nerve sometimes? Absolutely. Can that be the place from which the intervention comes? Nope. That is relationship damaging interaction. That's where relationships get fried. So how do we deal with that? We accept that we are in fact emotional beings. Um, some teachers are embarrassed to accept the fact that they harbor these difficult feelings about kids because they have this image of themselves as a nurturing, helpful, caring person. How could I want to throttle the little SOB? Um, and so I think it's important that we put out there on the table and examine it and turn it 360 degrees, that these internal reactions to some kids make you human, not bad. And it's, a, it's understandable and probably inevitable that they will happen, so let's make it explicit so that we can then uh, self-regulate it. If we leave it uh, implicit, then it has the opportunity to be surreptitious in, in weaving its way into our motivations and how we react. So I can only self-regulate something if I admit that it's right there and in, in, and in front of me. So I have to monitor my, I have to be reflective. I have to be a reflective teacher. I have to monitor my thoughts and emotions. I have to reframe. Um, Aaron, I'm going to ask with this reframing, I've been trying to learn a new phrase. I've asked for it twice. I can never remember it when I want it. Does anybody who's listening know the, frame, the phrase that is, when a child is misbehaving, don't think what's wrong with them. Think what happened to them. Do I have that right? Anybody know the answer yes. to that? Yeah, no, you have that right. It's a lot of times when we're talking about with uh, trauma-informed care, it's not thinking about, um, you know, why are you doing this or why are you behaving the way you are, but what happened. Right. Right. What, yep. not, not what's wrong with you. Or, not right. what's wrong with you. Not what, 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 right. what happened that to you. It, right. Once you know a child's backstory in terms mm -hmm. of trauma-informed care, you won't be furious with them. You'll want to cry. Right. Right? All right. But when you lose sight of the backstory and all you've got is this oppositional person in front of you who's challenging your authority and making you feel helpless and hopeless, it's real easy to forget about the backstory. Um, so we need to reframe and remember the backstory. Uh, maintaining that cool exterior yourself. Taking care of yourself so that you don't burn out. Um, sometimes, in fact, working with difficult kids, discretion is the better part of valor. There were times in my career when I was at the top of my game working with uh, students who had who displayed especially challenging behavior that I was, could comfortably say to my peers, can you please take over this interaction? All right, I need a moment. 
I need to step away, I need to come to 10, I need to self-regulate, I'm on the verge of making decisions that uh, aren't in the child's or my own best interest. Um, can you relieve me? Um, none of us are endlessly patient. Um, and then, uh, you know, heal, you know, physician heal thyself. Um, if you're not at least as good to yourself as you are to your students, you won't be good to them for very long. So make sure, making sure that you don't come into school with your balloon filled with stress and from your own life and that um, you come in ready to emotionally deal, right? We talk about emotional overlays. Some people, for students, we call them barriers to learning. What I would argue that teachers also have emotional overlays that we might think of as barriers to effective teaching. And our professional obligation is to minimize them to the extent we can by taking care of ourselves and then self-regulating them because the fact of the matter is none of us have perfectly hunky-dory lives devoid of stress, again, except for me because, again, I am fully self-actualized, uh, residing atop Maslow's hierarchy. This is, um, these are data from, um, well, I can't even remember the name. It's, uh, it'll come up in a minute uh, when I hit the forward button, right? So the research has looked into the extent to which mental set in general, as we've just talked about it, as well as the component parts of it, with itness and emotional objectivity, um, uh, impact students' behavior, and you can see that among it, with itness is number one. In fact, as far back as the 80s, Brophy, who was uh, a very respected scholar in special education, was identifying being fully present in the moment as the singularly most important aspect of effective classroom management. That, it, that the technologies, the strategies are irrelevant if you're not allocating them in a very thoughtful, fully present way. Um, and so in this, uh, you know, the, the effect sizes, um, you can see that the largest effect size is for withitness, and second, for the largest effect size is for um, in general, and then emotional objectivity being important. Those are reasonably large effect sizes uh, that we calculate uh, in research. Um, and uh, the importance of effect sizes is that if every study has effect sizes for every type of intervention, then we can compare effect sizes across types of interventions. Um, so there's been a move in scholarship to include effect sizes in all publications. Um, and you can see, uh, I think we need to caution here, that the effect sizes are probably large uh, due to uh, the relatively few number of studies that have looked at them, and that if there were more studies, the effect sizes likely wouldn't be so large. Um, but it's interesting that here with itness um, seems to be twice as important as emotional objectivity, but emotional objectivity. And then uh, it was Marzano, those, that's a, um, those are Marzano and Marzano's data as well. I just don't have the reference up there. But um, in the same literature, um, Marzano and Marzano did a meta-analysis and Pickering did a meta-analysis, the average effect size for mental set is 1.294 as compared to it's larger than disciplinary interventions, it's larger than for teacher-student relationships, and it's larger than for rules and procedures. So this mental set is actually arguably, at least according to this meta-analysis, more important than all those ABA strategies. Personally, I don't see it as either or. I see it as a complementary integration of all of it so that we benefit from the effect sizes of all of it in a nice complementary and recursive way. All right, so what does this look like in the real world? I think we build this thing of, okay, so you want to like have cohesive narratives about what it looks like with real kids. And so th this is something I've been working on for a while. So step one is make sure students know precisely what is expected of them because, one, you have given clear, unambiguous direction, and you've given that direction to engage in behaviors that you systematically taught previously using explicit instruction, explicit direct instruction. Right, so we have a whole set of content in just those two bullets. There, I have probably 10 slides that are on nothing but how to give good, clear, unambiguous directions and avoid shooting yourself in the foot by giving crummy, vague, multiple, contradictory suggestions. Right, you can hear a teacher, will you please get your book out and um, 
right? And then when you get noncompliance, the, the request. We don't like to make it, right? I think I use the word directive because I'm uncomfortable with the word command. It sounds too authoritarian, but I'm equally uncomfortable with the idea of making suggestions to students. We expect compliance. That's our job is to get compliance to run the ship, right? And so I personally um, – uh, let's talk about the negative effect sizes later. Um, uh, uh, I'm a little confused about them too, and I don't want to mislead you about what they are. I don't know if you guys could see the entire question pop up. Um, I may have to look into that further and get back to you. Uh, I had the exact same thought, why are they negative? What are they negatively correlating with or what are they? And I'd have to go back to the um, – and, and uh, look at the methodology in the, in the studies. Um, the fact of the matter is, is I may even have to talk to a methodologist to have it explained to me um, in a way that I could then concisely and accurately explain it to you. So that's a great question. I had it myself. I'm sorry. I can't provide a better answer, but if you give me time, I will. Um, so, um, yep. Um, Right, then if needed, we're going to provide that. Right, so this is the teacher with that cohesive narrative in, the, um, um, in, uh, in their head that is guiding their mental set, being fully conscious and present in the moment, saying, these are the steps I'm following. I'm giving a good, clear, unambiguous direction uh, to engage in behaviors that I've previously taught using explicit instruction. Um, I'm providing the pre-correction that I indicated I would provide. Now, again, in the literature, and I agree, pre-correction should be faded over time. Students should eventually be able to self-regulate, and you shouldn't have to pre-correct every time you ask them to do something. But at the beginning of the year, and for students who have, are less likely to comply, pre-corrections um, are more critical. Um, actively supervise, move about and scan the room, be consciously present in the moment, display with itness. Um, and as needed, if you get noncompliance, uh, exhibit emotional objectivity. Distinguish between compliers and noncompliers. Reinforce students who comply with directives. Be sure to praise appropriate behavior more frequently than you redirect inappropriate behavior. I've agreed on a five to one. I've, I've gone up from four to one to five to one. Reinforce initial noncompliers only if they comply in response to your acknowledgement of noncompliers. This is key. Reinforcing compliers serves two functions. It strengthens and grows the appropriate response of the comp compliers and helps ensure you'll get that response again in the future. And it also is the initial intervention for non-compliers. When the non-complier sees experiences of them getting ignored while the compliers are getting acknowledged, there are a certain number of students who will observe that happen, then as a result display the appropriate behavior so that you can then also acknowledge them. Now again, my background is in kids with EBD, and if it was this easy with kids with EBD, there would be no kids with EBD. What we're talking about is shaping the behavior of the 80% of the kids who need modest tier one behavioral support. We're going to have to do more than reinforce compliers in order to get hardcore non-compliers um, to make good choices. But for those other 80% kids who have mindlessly drifted away from the behavioral expectations you've taught, this can be a very powerful intervention that I have seen well, work clinically very powerfully, and certainly the research supports it. Remember throughout these procedures that your role is that of neutral umpire who gives students feedback based on the quality of the decisions they make. Your responsibility is the promotion of social justice for all. The key is to be capable of delivering reinforcement or correction in an equally comfortable manner and getting your five to one right. So that the whole thing about all that day one stuff where you talk about values and they put their handprints on it, what you're communicating to the students is, I am an arbiter of our values. Uh, my job as your teacher is not to control you. It's to um, support you in being a good community member and to recognize when you are and to scaffold your performance when you aren't. That's my job. Not because I'm trying to control you in an authoritarian way, but because we're trying to create a community in which social justice is the uh, defining um, theme. Step two, giving – all right, so in my
my mind. I've given a clear directive to engage in a behavior I've previously taught, and I've affirmed my compliers, and then I've observed to see if my affirmation of the compliers uh, moves some of my non-compliers into compliance, and if they did, I affirm them too, but I'm still fully present in the moment. I'm still deploying with itness. I still have a good mental set, and I still have some non-compliers. What do I do next? And you know what you want to do next? Is you want to be not thinking about what you have to do next at the moment. All this stuff needs to be well rehearsed and thought of in advance so that when you arrive at the moment, you know exactly what to do. So in this case, if you have students who choose not to follow directions or are behaving in ways that are inconsistent with class values and expectations, a teacher might say something like this. Students who are not following directions are making it difficult for me to do my best teaching and for others to do their best learning. I hope everyone can make good choices that allow us all to do our best work. All right, now that is for the benefit of the kids who are not complying. But it has a couple things. You want to rehearse this dialogue so that you can say, oh, it's a very contrived way to talk. And I can tell you 30 years later who taught me to talk that way because nothing else in life teaches you to talk like that if somebody doesn't take you aside and say, hey, when you're dealing with somebody who's at odds with you know, what you're trying to accomplish, rather than barking at them or cajoling them or using a note, no stop, don't, Try this instead, because you know what? Those no stop don'ts, you're, um, they they run the risk of being a source of reinforcement for that uh, inappropriate behavior that will unfortunately serve to strengthen and sustain that behavior. Let's get that out of our out of our rock, and let's use another antecedent prevention intervention, whereby it's both a sort of prompt intervention after the fact, but it's also an antecedent for the next allocation of the student's behavior. And you'll notice there are a couple. Um, you might want to uh, pair this dialogue with proximity to control, move over to the table that's still being a little rambunctious, and, and say it again. But there are a couple um, um, key things in there. The reason you say this, and I don't directly talk to the student, is because I want to avoid the potential reinforcement of, a, of addressing directly noncompliance. I want to minimize the likelihood that I have to directly address noncompliance. And so this is another antecedent prompt, I'm sorry, this is a response prompt that hopefully will move some more of the, and remember, I'm only thinking that this response prompt is going to be enough behavioral support for 80% of the kids. You know, and on Monday, maybe, you know, uh, five, five of the, your kids need this. And then on Tuesday, it's three of your kids, but it's they're different kids on a day-to-day -day basis who need you because they drift away from those behavioral expectations that you taught, right? By engaging in this language, you're also communicating consistency with values and rules. You're not jumping down their throat. You're not being harsh. You're not being critical. You're communicating your um, commitment to um, your your uh, social contract and the values that the classroom's based on. And then the third thing, and you know, the slide gets so busy, I want to have clouds all over it because I know I'm saying these things, but they're not in the slide, but they're critical, is that you're focusing on the responsibility of the student to make the choice. You're not saying, I'm the authority who's going to coerce you into a compliance by making bad things happen to you. What you're implying is the choices you make affect what happens going forward. These are your decisions to have these consequences unfold or not. And that's a sort of foreshadowing of step three. At this juncture, the re literature recommends issuing a timeout right then. Never go to them. Now, we could, at this point, go to a student and use that uh, error correction procedure. And I think if I adjusted these slides, that's what I would do next. I would say, engage in the brief error correction procedure. Go over to the student, have them tell you the behavioral expectation for the activity you're engaged in. Have them show you the behavioral activity, right? So at that point, I am specifically engaging the non-complier. If you can imagine a step three, that was that instead of this. I'm sorry for that. That's an evolution of my own thinking, literally right here in the moment. But step three should probably be the use of that um, brief non-reinforcing um, behavior correction procedure through which you directly address the non-complier for the first time. Say their name, 
ask them to tell you the behavioral expectation, ask them to show you the behavioral expectation, affirm them when they do. Right? That's your brief non-reinforcing correction procedure. Of course, now that you have done that, every time I directly address noncompliance, I have to be mindful of the potential that that addressing of noncompliance is a source of teacher attention that will sustain the noncompliance. So I always have to be mindful of that. Um, in the literature, people are so mindful of that that they recommend not doing it and going immediately to time out, particularly for kids whose behavior is inappropriate behavior is maintained by teacher attention. Right? So after I've given that, I want to remind all students it's important to make good choices so that uh, I can do my best teaching and students can do their best learning. Verbal reaction. This is a script that you're following. If you scan the room and still see noncompliance, you can either do the brief recorrection or immediately go to timeout. And particularly if you've done the brief um, non reinforcing correction procedure, Dozens of times with the student, um, you might think to yourself, "Oh, it's not just mindlessness; it 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 um, it's ineffective, and um, perhaps the behavior is being sustained. That the corrective procedure is a source of teacher attention for the student. And in those cases, you really just want to say the correction procedure is over. We've done it enough. I'm not reteaching in the moment anymore. Um, your behavior has been so intrusive, right? And so, what does that sound like? And it, and here's what I want to help you understand. I've been teaching master students here for over 20 years. I can teach them to pass my tests. They can tell me the eight essential components of timeout. They can write me the timeout definition. You know what they struggle to do? Use timeout in the context of, of genuine, real-time interaction with students. What does the issuance of a timeout sound like? Well, it doesn't sound like, that's it, get out of here, right? because then I'm not exhibiting emotional objectivity any longer, right? Um, but you can imagine there's no shortage of teachers who send kids ostensibly to time out um, in an agitated state, and that their agitation is clear. Uh, so time out might sound like this. When you make it difficult for me to teach and others to learn, you're letting me know that your behavior, with your behavior, that you are not ready to be part of the class. Please report to time out. Of course, whenever you use time out, you have to be equally vigilant that it doesn't serve as a source of negative reinforcement. And so those are the those are the clinical judgments that you're making all the way. Is my behavior correction procedure um, a source of teacher attention that's sustaining the behavior? Is my sending the student to timeout? Right? You can only use timeout if students value time in. If they're ambivalent or find the classroom aversive to begin with, timeout cannot possibly be effective. If they don't value being there, all time out is, is is the temporary suspension of the opportunity to be reinforced. That's all time out is, the temporary suspension of the opportunity to uh, be re to access reinforcement, to be reinforced. All right. And so if there is no source of reinforcement in the environment for the student to begin with and they experience it as aversive, you can't use time out because you're not suspending the opportunity to be reinforced because there is no reinforcement there for them to begin with. Only Timeout only works if you create a climate and a culture that all your students come to value being a part of and experience as a loss when they have to be away from it for an amount of time. Another possible individualized leverage point at this point rather than timeout, um, particularly if you think the student uh, well, if for any type of student, you might do this, whether it's escape, avoid, or get obtained teacher attention, um, is to apply differential reinforcement. So in this case, it might sound like this. When you make it difficult for me to teach and others to learn, you, you are choosing not to earn all of your DPR points. DPR, in this case, would be the daily progress report for check and check out. But it could just as easily be um, an individual behavior contract. Um, that isn't tied out into the, that, that isn't a full blown tier two intervention. So it could be an individualized, differentiated support that you're providing in the classroom in the term of, of a behavior contract or a token economy, or even a group contingency. Maybe the student, maybe you've set up the contingency that, so by making good choos, choices, the student isn't only earning uh, positive rewards for himself, he's earning positive outcome. You know, the class will get to do something if he meets his target. Right, but in this case, because it was easy, I used DPR as the example because I know DPR requires quantitative feedback at the end. Right, so you would go to the student, and my my sense of too many teachers is we put behavioral contracts in place, and.
and the teacher doesn't leverage the behavioral contract in the moment with the student in appropriate way to prompt better responding. So that would sound like this, choosing not to earn all your DPR points for this period. You can still earn the remaining points by making better choices starting now. I know you want to earn your DPR target for the day, so I hope you can make choices that make good things happen for you and are fair for everyone else. Again, the language is contrived. It's a uh, very contrived way to talk to somebody, but um, as it says here, note students always choose to earn or not earn their points. They never lose them. We never take them away. There's an exception to that rule. It's called response cost, but we're not getting into that today. Um, all right, so too many teachers in their exasperation and in their, in their failure to maintain uh, emotional objectivity um, uh, use taking a point as a socially acceptable form of counter-aggression. That's it, you've lost the point. Your three is gone, right, if they reference the, the the system at all. In too many instances, we put uh, contracts in place, and the if the contract is referenced at all throughout the day, it's only referenced at the end of the period where the kid gets told he earned a zero, rather than leveraged in the moment with teachers, right? And so in this, the other part of this language is by putting the responsibility on the child and making it explicitly clear that what happens going forward is a reflection of their choice, you are also investing in, in maintaining the relationship because you're making it difficult for the student to perceive you as the hostile person who's taking from them, who's causing them these consequences, these um, loss of privileges or these timeouts or these not earning points. The language is all about, I am the neutral umpire, I, am equal, I can hang either way, whether you make a good choice or a bad choice. I'm equally comfortable. The feedback I give to you will come fluently either way. Don't make a choice because I want you to, a good choice because I want you to. Make a good choice based on what's in your own self-enlightened best interest. That's what you're trying to communicate to the child. Because the moment these children who are going to test you at these moments have an expectancy bias that as adults you're going to be a bastard and you're going to take, and you're going to be hostile, and you're going to be um, aggressive and, and non-caring. And you perceive yourself as, as delivering neutral consequences or, or natural consequences for the poor choice the child made. But, but reality is subjective, and the child perceives you as a hostile person. They don't say to themselves, oh, that's a natural consequence for the poor choice I made. I understand why the teacher behaved that way. They say to themselves, look at the SOB taken saw from me. I knew he was just another mean adult. So we really need to use language that puts the focus on their choice, that they're, they're the ones who are controlling whether the good consequences ensue or don't ensue. Um, and then we just, you know, I, I won't read through all these bullets. It's a very busy um, slide, but it really just the idea that uh, relationships have an arc um, and that at the beginning we're just nurturing that relationship or we're just inviting the relationship and then we're nurturing and growing it. And finally, when we really believe that kids trust us and respect us and see us as dimensional people who have their best interests at heart and we've quieted any fears they have about us being uncaring, inconsistent, at odds with them, then we can start to call on that relationship, leverage that relationship to support the child's uh, um, taking on um, more effort, more responsibility in a variety of ways. So very quickly, the fundamental ABA teacher competencies. This is sort of a, a quick review of what we did with uh, webinar number one as we examined tiers one, two, and three of PBIS to make explicit the extent to which prevention, teaching, reinforcing, and extinguishing um, uh, activities are apparent in all three tiers. We tend to think of the prevent, teach, reinforce, and extinguish as um, sort of the basis for BIPs and, uh, at tier three, and they indeed are, but prevent, teach, reinforce, and extinguish, uh, we can deconstruct tier one, school-wide and class-wide into those uh, component parts, and we can, we can deconstruct uh, tier two interventions like social skills instruction and um, check and check out into those component parts. So it's just a quick summary of um, the fundamental teacher competencies. Uh, and so when you've done 
when you've done these relationship, right, um, each of the activities that uh, constitute level one, level two, and level three relationship building activities, the sub bullets within there, and you've been um, consistent with these applied in, in that context, you've also infused uh, the reliable and valid uh, use of ABA-based uh, strategies with integrity, um, you've implemented Tier 1 in a classroom. A teacher has held her own or his own and done what's expected of them. There's some differentiated supports in there. Where we've incentivized some kids. We've provided – this is, when you've, when you've done the things that we've spent the last hour and a half talking about, you've done Tier 1 in a classroom. And uh, students who remain unresponsive are therefore legitimate candidates for Tier 3 supports. To end on a more touchy-feely note, you've probably all seen this quote. I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element. It is my personal approach that creates the climate. It is my daily mood that makes the weather. I possess tremendous power to make life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture and an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt, or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis is escalated or de-escalated and a person is humanized or dehumanized. If we preach... If we treat people as they are, if we make them worse, if we treat people as they ought to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. I would expect that each of you know people who are soothers, and maybe you're soothers yourself, but people who, when you're agitated, when you have self-doubt, when you're fretting about things, um, when you perhaps are defining yourself um, by the gap between um, – where you think you should be versus where you think you are, and you're in emotional distress over those things. There are some people who come along and soothe you, right? And then there are other people who come along and make it worse by asking pointed questions and pushing you out, right? Being too intrusive or tell, you know, telling you to get over it and being dismissive of what you're struggling or however it is they do it. But I think each of us, um, well, I think each of us is capable of being a soother or a feather ruffler, um, but I think for the most part in this profession, we tend to be oriented towards being soothers. And so what we're trying to do in this relationship building is really be a soother when um, the, the aspects of life that are hard and difficult and prompt our little souls who are making their way through our schools to, to support them in the moment um, uh, uh, to be wiser, smarter, more self-regulated than they are so that the, we can support them in the moment in the ways that they need. And the final thought for today, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Number two is in the books. Yes, that was excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Um, you actually came in exactly on time, even though it says 12-11. Um, you started at 10-11, um, so that was perfect, another perfect one. Um, I guess I, what I'll do is I'll leave the recording on for a moment to see if you have any questions or comments that um, your peers might um, find helpful also. Oh, great. We're getting some very positive feedback from Irvin. I really like some of the things that you said, but I think, you know, the crux to summarize is really about the student-teacher relationships and the mindfulness and the, um, the presence that you bring to the classroom and how you choose to interact with students, no matter what setting you're in, whether it's an alternative setting, a general education setting, um, preschool, high school, college, like it's about what you bring to the table and in the mindset and the choices um, that you, the way that you choose to interact. So. Um, that's a that's a hard piece to teach sometimes. It is. Um, there's a good literature out there uh, with it, and this in particular might seem like either you have it, you don't. But there's pretty strong evidence that with it, and this can be taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, I think the real challenge comes in is um, we teach this behavior management stuff as if it is the only thing the teacher's doing. And we forget that they're managing complex instruction at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, among other things, relating to their peers, um, being supervised, um, managing the materials in the classroom. I mean, right, teachers by definition multitask. And when we teach this, um, 
we teach it as if it's the only thing you're doing. Like you're just self-regulating yourself yeah. through this right. and that yeah. you don't have all those other things. And the issue, of course, is that to the extent that the mindset or the with itness is a function of short-term working memory, we know that short-term, I believe the research says that short-term working memory, you can keep five to seven things mm -hmm. in working memory max at a time and mm -hmm. only for a very brief amount of time. And so the more we load a teacher's plate, the more complex. Um, you know, I could be doing a, a bang-up job teaching World War II history and get so in, embedded in that and engrossed in that that um, I'm no longer mindful of the behavior management and the relationship building side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is, you know, here's what I believe. It's not very hard to be a mediocre teacher. It's really hard to be a really good teacher. Yeah, they should be exhausted by the end of the day. <laughs> it is exhausting. Talk about whole brain activities. <laughs> yep. All right. I don't see any other questions. Um, um, I'm just going to relay to you because I think it was just sent to me that Irvin said that he thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. He was engaged the entire time, and he wanted to thank you. So um, on sir. that note... Um, on that note, if you have any questions, please let us know. Again, this will be archived. Um, I will send out an email to the listserv when it is posted. Actually, I'll stop the recording. So thank you, everyone, for joining, um, and we hope that you found this as helpful as we did.